And today we're in Genesis chapter 21 again, but we're now in uh, beginning in verses 8 and following. And we come across some of the complications that are found within the lives of Sarah and Abraham and those around them. You know, it is interesting how sometimes our past actions can affect our present. And sometimes things that we were innocent of in the past can come back and bite us in the present. And it's all sorts of things can make our life miserable in the present, can turn our world upside down. We could be in a moment of rejoicing, a moment of great pride and of happiness, and then the very next day, everything be pulled out from under us and we do not know what to do or what's going on. We may not even understand what hit us. And that's exactly what we see happening in this passage. It is the well-known story of, of, uh, of Hagar and Ishmael being cast out. It begins in verse 8 and it simply says, And the child grew. Now in this case, the child is Isaac. And was weaned. And Abram made a great feast on that day. Isaac was weaned. This was a very significant time because in those days, your weaning took place probably around age three. It wasn't, you know, as we do it a lot quicker because mothers go back to work, different things like that. But in the ancient world, you weaned them for a lot longer period of time. And it wasn't until age three that, you, that the childs were finally weaned. And it was a very important day because this was the time period that if anything bad was going to happen to the child, it usually happened. And so this was the time that most parents would take a sigh of relief and say, my child is going to live at least till they're a teenager. <laughs> If not till very adulthood. It was a time period because you had a lot of, you know, a lot of infant mortality uh, during that time. And that's why a lot of times this, some, this is just a side note. We hear that the ancients didn't live as long as we do. That's not exactly right. Those that lived through childhood lived as long, if not longer than we did. It's just that there was a higher infant mortality rate. And so when you calculate the higher infant mortality rate, it pulls the average age down. But if you made it past weaning, you made it past, you made it into adulthood, you most likely lived a long and full life. So this is one of those milestones, and they're celebrating it. It's a time of great celebration. And then suddenly we see in verse 9, and the ESV puts the word but... So we know something negative is about to happen. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had bore to Abraham, laughing. Now if you remember, Isaac's name meant laughter. And so you have a little play on Isaac's name here. You have Ishmael laughing. And in the sense, it's a word that we... Well, a lot of translators will take negatively, but it's not necessarily negative. But we have to understand that we're seeing this from Sarah's perspective. Ishmael at this time would have been about age 16 or 17. Isaac would have been around age 3. And you can easily see that Ishmael may have just been playing with Isaac. You know, as you know, big brothers do with a little brother, you know, maybe teasing him or something like that. You know how that is. But Sarah saw it, and she took it as making fun of Isaac, her son. And notice the verse 10. So she said to Abraham, and notice her words. In her words, she does not name Hagar. She does not name Ishmael. She's like somebody who's a relative or somebody who's a friend of a friend, and they never refer to you by, their by your name. They always call you that man or that person or that dude or something like that. For some reason, they don't like you and they won't even use your name in a sentence. You may have done something a long time ago. You may not, you may not even know what you did. But, you know, here we, but we do know the backstory of Sarah and Hagar. We do know how Sarah had handed Hagar over to Abraham as a surrogate mother and how Hagar had 
uh, bore a child and then Hagar started uh, rubbing it into Sarah's nose and Sarah then uh, began really putting the screws on Hagar. And if you remember, Hagar actually ran away and God had told Hagar, go back, you'll be okay. Everything will be all right, just go back and put up with Sarah. So you know that these two ladies had been living together for about 16, 17 years, and they had not been getting along well. This is a boss and a an employee who have worked together for over 17 years, and they still don't get along. Okay? And probably, you know, just, and so anyways, he's just exasperated at this point. So Sarah comes to Abram and says, cast out the slave woman with her son. For the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. Now Sarah, based upon the laws of the time uh, that we found in other places, Sarah was basically demanding something that was her legal right. She was in for putting forth a legal right that she had, which was that she was telling Abram, you give um, Hagar her freedom, send her away so that she will not inherit anything with my son. My son has the right of inheritance. She does not. And the rights of inheritance were very important in the ancient world. And we find that this thing, this was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. You know, Abraham actually really liked Ishmael. And this whole thing just kind of tore Abraham back. In fact, the wording here implies that they argued, that Sarah and Abraham argued over this. They were, they, they, Abraham was saying, no, I can't do that. Ishmael is my son. I can't send him away and call, disinherit him. But she was saying you had to. And, you know, Sarah's actually also appealing to the promise that God had given to Abraham that Isaac was the promised child, not Ishmael. But then we see in verse 12 that God said to Abraham, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says, you do as she tells you. For through Isaac you shall your offspring be named. And I will make a great a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So God evidently came to Abraham at night in a dream and said, to Abraham, Abram, Abraham, do what Sarah's asked. Isaac is the one who has is the one you're, you're the promise will be brought through. He is the one who I'm going to work through. But also don't worry about Ishmael. I will take care of him. And because he is part of your covenant relationship, because he is part of you, he will also produce a nation. So do not worry about them. Do as Hagar says. And then we come along and it says, uh, the so in the morning, Abram rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. Now, it's very interesting. There's more to this. We know culturally and, and through, every, through other things that more is, was, was, uh, was given to the person who was freed and let go. But at the time, but what we see emphasized here is, is the provisions that he provides bread and water. And we get the sense it's a type of water bag and he gives it to Hagar. And he actually, this is a type of water bag that would be the type that uh, we have nowadays that you've seen where they'll put it in a backpack and you have it a really heavy, large thing of water on your back. And we see here that Abram puts it on her. It's too heavy for her to put on herself, but she, but he puts it on her, provided her with plenty of water and food. Now, in the past, Hagar had run away, and at that time, we know she knew where she was going. She was headed back to her family. But in this case, we're told something differently. She departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. What, this situation caught her completely off guard. She did not see it coming. And when she was hit with this and given her freedom and given the, 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 the gifts and given the provision and handed her son, 
and she left, she was literally in a state of shock. And so she didn't go anywhere. She just kind of wandered and walked out into the desert. And it is a place whereby if you look in the desert, it's kind of like if you've been in northern Texas, it's very flat land with a lot of bushes. And you could, if you're not paying attention, you can just wander all, all sorts of different directions because there's no, nothing to make any difference unless you're following a path. But evidently she stopped following, but she just started wandering and walking. She was in such total shock, so overwhelmed with what had happened. One day she was comfortable, had her own place, had her son with her, had plenty of food. Yeah, she had to put up with a mean boss, but she had, you know, she, she'd learned how to deal with that. But all of a sudden now, she's out. And so she wanders. And then we're told when the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Now, Ishmael was older. And at this time, I could see him trying to be the man and helping his mother. She was still in charge. He was still under her teaching. So he had to fall. He could say, Mom, we need to go this way. But she would go that way. I could see that type of frustration. And I could even see him saying, you know, giving her water at the neglect of himself. Because she is in such a position of being so distraught. But in doing so... As many caregivers, happens to many caregivers, the caregiver wears out before the one who is, giving, who is receiving the care. And it's one thing you have to be careful about. Many times the caregiver will actually end up dying uh, before the one who is receiving the care. Because they literally wear themselves out taking care of the other person and not taking care of their own needs. And that's probably what happened here with... Um, with uh, Ishmael. Well, anyways, he gets to the point he can't go any further. She lays him down under a bush and she leaves and she goes about an arrow's shot away. And it's enough distance that because of the bushes and stuff, she might, she's not going to be able to see him. But more importantly, she can't hear him groaning. She's crying out and weeping. But look at verse 17. And God heard the voice of the boy. God did not respond to her cry. God was responding to the cry of Ishmael. And then from heaven, he said to her, what are your troubles, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. She had gotten to the point she couldn't listen to his groanings, to his pain, to his sorrow, to his difficulties now, and had left. But God was still listening to him, even though she could no longer do it. And so God responded from heaven and some of the rabbinics folks say that it was, it's just to show that God was immediately, he was watching the whole time. He knew what was going on, but he wanted to lift her up, let her realize. He says, fear not for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is, even though you can't hear her. Lift up, up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand for I will make him into a great nation. Now here's kind of odd, you know, God says, I'm gonna make him into a great nation. You'd think God would say, I'm gonna provide for, I'm gonna get you what you needed, but no, he just tells her, I have plans for this young man. I'm gonna bless him. And then verse 19, the Lord opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave it to the boy a drink. And the God saw with the and God was with the boy. Notice that God was with Ishmael, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Notice, throughout this whole narrative, God is actually with Ishmael. 
and he blesses. You know, it is a kind of a hard passage when you look at it in many different ways. You know, his whole world was tore upside down. It's very interesting that he's the one maybe innocently playing with Isaac that caused, started, caused, him, caused him and his mother to be chased out or sent out, sent away. But it's also he's the one whose prayer and cry to God brought God's response. Many times we kind of forget that in our lives that, yeah, we may have caused the trouble. God may be just sitting and waiting for us to come and respond and call out to him. We find also here that God does respect the laws of man and the customs of man. Even though he may or may not approve of it, he still accepts and follows those customs and laws. After all, he handed earth, the, the, the authority of self-rule over to humanity in the Noahic covenant. But the thing I want to see here is that God used us to see again, is that God keeps his promises even when people are unable to, as Abraham was unable to continue to care for Isaac, or unwilling, as Sarah was unwilling to continue to do right by Isaac and Hagar. But God still kept his promises to them. Now they went through a hard time and that brings me to the last point. Sometimes God has to blind us to the solutions to our problems until we finally are willing to see through our desperation and to trust him. Notice that she had to go back to Ishmael. She had to lift Ishmael's head and comfort him. And it wasn't until then that she saw the well of water. She laid the boy right next to a well of water and didn't even see it because she was so wrapped up in her own sorrow. The need, the supply was right there in front of her. And she could not see it because she was so wrapped up in her own sorrow. You know, sometimes God has to work with us and bring us down to a low point before he can actually provide for us. Before he can actually show his thing. And the, you know, Ishmael, the thing about Ishmael is very interesting. If you remember, Ishmael means God heard me. God, he, the God who hears me. And so God showed himself to Ishmael as the God who hears Ishmael. God showed himself as the one who hears to the, the one whose God hears him. In other words, we say Ishmael to Ishmael. One being a verb, the other being a noun. And so in this time, let us keep this in mind as we go forward and apply these to our lives. You know, life can be very complicated for many different reasons. The past can come and whack us in a way that we just don't see it coming and knock us off our feet. But God is faithful. And God accomplishes his promises no matter what happens, no matter what disaster hits our lives.